Hello, my name is Jonathan Clements and I'm the author of Anime, a history for the British Film Institute. And I'm here to talk about Top O Nerai, a gunbuster made famous uh, by the Gainax studio in 1988 and something of a left turn from their acclaimed earlier movie, The Wings of Oniarmis. The writer and producer Toshio Okada in his memoirs writes about the experience of announcing Gunbuster at a press conference in which the journalists all look shocked and then disappointed and eventually they start to sidle away because they were hoping for something serious and instead they're getting pitched this thing about schoolgirls piloting giant robots. And while Gynax themselves have been heard to call Gunbuster a product, a cynical, crowd-pleasing assemblage of in-jokes and fan service, it is also deadly serious, a wonderful sci-fi epic and a show that really wrong-foots the audience with sudden pathos and tragedy. It is in fact my favourite anime and it's a real honour to be able to talk about it for three solid hours. And if you can read Japanese, you may have already noticed that as the camera tracks down across this newspaper article, the inset photographs of the dead crew members have some familiar faces, including Hideaki Anno, the director, and Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, the animator. And Gunbuster is absolutely loaded with little asides like that. And I'll do my best to flag them as we go, as well as some masterful feats of storytelling and drama. And as the opening credits kick off, we have the briefest glimpse of Japan from orbit, and we see that it is uh, substantially altered. There's a bridge connecting Hokkaido and Honshu, for example, and Kyoto and Shiga provinces appear to have been wiped out or flooded. There's some incredibly subtle world building in this show, starting with colour photographs in the Azahi Shimba newspaper, and I'll do my best to point them out as we go along, with reference not only to the original video series, but to several multimedia spin-offs that have fleshed out the story. But while the credits are going on, let's talk first about the title, which exists in two elements. Top o nerai literally means aim for the top, and it has elements of top gun in its intention, but it also slyly alludes to aim for the ace, which was a 1970s manga series by Sumika Yamamoto, which was a quintessential sporting story. It's been adapted for the screen several times, uh, including the original anime TV show in 1973, and it helped establish many of the commonplace tropes of sports stories in Japan, including the klutzy rookie, the supposedly effortless elite player, the harsh but fair coach, and the, and the foreign rival. And Gunbuster occupies a fascinating position between the wings of Oniamis and the same studio's later Evangelion. It was conceived by Gainax's Toshio Okada, who wrote the first two episodes, but later episodes were written by Hiroyuki Yamaga, refusing to be credited on a mere video after directing the Oniamis feature and uh, Hideaki Anno himself, who crafted the last two episodes. And it's a creative vision born out of incredible, mutually destructive tensions. Uh, a light-hearted sci-fi uh, show, a heavy-hitting war movie, a tragic romance, or even, as I will argue, a heartfelt allegory for how it feels to be a creative in modern media, obsessed with spaceships and aliens while your old school buddies get old and drift away. But we're starting, as the palm trees tell us, in Okinawa, which was historically the launching site for many of the kamikaze pilots that defended Japan in World War II. And there will be multiple allusions, not only to Okinawa, but also to Kihachi Okamoto's 1971 film, The Battle of Okinawa. Uh, and in fact, as part of the brainstorming process, the creators asked themselves what their sci-fi anime would look like if Okamoto had directed it. And we should start ticking off the characters before we run low on time. So let's begin with Noriko Tokaya, our leading lady. Like most of the female characters in Gunbuster, she's named after one of the women who actually work at Gainax. In this case, Noriko Tokaya, the wife of animator Shinji Higuchi, who at the time worked in cell processing uh, and continued to do so, often for Studio Ghibli. She's played by another Noriko, Noriko Hidaka, a voice actress who at the time was riding high on the success of her role in the popular series Touch but also a Satsuki in My Neighbor Totoro. And Hidaka has a, is a voice acting superstar who would go on to play uh, Jean in Gainax's Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water, although her role in Gunbuster was not a big deal in her career. I can only guess at this because she recently published her voice acting memoirs and Gunbuster barely gets a mention. 
The first time I saw Gunbuster was actually in a class at Kansai Gaidai in 1992 uh, when a friend of mine brought this episode in to show to the other students in the Manga as Mirror course. Now the lecturer really fixated on this moment where Noriko rounds on the bullying mean girls because it encapsulates a vital concept at the heart of sports anime. Uh, Noriko is being accused of being special but she insists that she works hard. She insists that she's got where she is not through any nepotism or pity appointments, but because she's a hard-working, dedicated person. And here we get our first glimpse of Kazumi Amano, shot surrounded by roses and soft focus highlights like she's a star ballerina, or indeed like her inspiration, Madam Butterfly from Aim for the Ace. She gets her name from Kazumi Amano, who was another Gainax employee who at the time was married to the writer Toshio Okada. Uh, in fact, I say she worked at Gainax, but I suspect she was just in the process of leaving the company because their daughter, Shizuka, was born only a few months after this episode was made. And Kazumi's name is one of those thorny, unanswerable puzzles in anime translation because in Japanese schools they use surnames, and so her name would be Amano, but everyone calls her Oneya-sama, which means big sister. And it's a real conundrum, easy to solve in a dub, but in a subtitled script you're confronted by the characters saying one thing on screen, uh, but another thing in the subtitles. It's not stated here, but in the prequel novel, Top O Nerai Damashi, it's revealed that Onesama uh, lost her father to a space monster event and subsequently helped Coach hold off an attack using the prototype Gunbuster. So that helps explain not only why she's so good with the machines, um, but why she has a degree of empathy at Noriko's loss. And uh, in this scene where Noriko puts her foot in it by saying that she's a natural, she then corrects herself by saying that she is a genius of effort. Uh, and that term would become a very popular saying at Gainax. Um, and it was used to butter up people every time they were asked to do something difficult. There's a lot of sun dappled lens flares and uh, bright sunshine in this episode because the animators are playing up Okinawa as Japan's tropical paradise. It's answer to Hawaii. In fact, in the backstory of Gunbuster, only revealed in the spin-offs, uh, um, you know, the novels and the manga, the idea is, is that actually Japan bought back Hawaii from the United States in 1996. Um, and then the United States tried to steal it back in 2008 by attacking Pearl Harbor. Now this is all very uh, kept very quiet in the anime proper because it's a political minefield to talk like that. But it's one of the things that makes Gunbuster such enduring fun is the way it evokes wartime Japan. Um, not as an enemy, but as how it must have felt from the inside. So there are all sorts of touches that recall the 1940s, such as the numbering on these hangars that we see in the assembly scene, which are very old-fashioned um, and evocative of the war. But there are also moments of extreme throwaway frivolity and pointless fanishness, such as the decision to call the robots the, uh, the RX trainers, for example. And very shortly, we're going to be introduced to Coach Orta, the girl's mentor figure and eventual love interest for Kazumi. And when we first see him, you'll notice he's sitting on a moped. And there's nothing too weird about that. We've already established the base is very large and it makes sense for humans, particularly infirm humans, um, to need a little help in getting around. I did initially think that it was a replica of the one written by Yusaku Matsuda in the 1979 series Detective Story, but that was a Lambretta and this is very clearly a Honda Cub. And the wild variation in tone is a symptom of the tussling creatives who work together on this show and the sense that it was conceived initially as a parody only to transform gradually into, in, in production into a work with much more serious overtones. So the coach, uh, Koichiro Ota, derives his, real na his name from the real name of the artist Mindanao who is called Koichiro Ota in real life and was a friend of the creators. In Gunbuster, Coach is an archetypal mentor figure with a troubled past. It's revealed in the spin-off novels he was actually subjected to a court-martial for being one of the few survivors of the Luxion incident, but was promoted after his acquittal. And we'll later discover, of course, that he has suffered a lethal dose of radiation, so he's not really going to survive all that long, which is one of the reasons why he's so determined to right the wrongs of his career by training his successors. And the cane we see him walking with is a deliberate shout out to a very similar walking stick that was used by uh, the character Dan Moroboshi in Ultraman Leo, a character who similarly uh, pushes a protagonist to their better limits.
coach is played by the actor uh, Norio Wakamoto, who has an absolutely fantastic voice. Uh, and he recently published his memoirs, a book called uh, Wakamoto Norio no Subaranai Hanashi. Um, but he doesn't talk about Gunbuster a whole lot in it. Um, despite giving such a memorable performance here, it doesn't seem to have uh, formed that much of a huge component of his career. He talks at far greater length about his roles as, for example, Cell in Dragon Ball and the Emperor Charles in uh, Code Geass. He also gets a lot of dubbing work, and in Japan, he's often the local voice of um, Vernon Wells and uh, Robert Nepper. Um, at 10.37 on my time code, there's a little tracking shot across the books on Noriko's shelf. And while most of them are fake textbooks, I will point out a couple of things, uh, like Steve Wozniak's biography for some reason, as well as a guide to ether physics that is tellingly in manga form rather than a normal textbook. This announcement of uh, the pilots, by the way, signed by Hiroaki Inoue, who uh, may well be the principal of the school in Gunbuster, but is also the producer of Gunbuster. And when we see that notice pinned to the wall, uh, you actually see the words Imperial Space Fleet, which is one of the few indicators that Japan has an empire again. Now, obviously, it's a huge shock uh, to everyone, including Noriko, that she's going to be a pilot. Although, since that is the title of this episode, it's presumably not a shock to you. And there is a lovely exploration here of doubt and belief, as everybody reacts in their own way to what appears to be such an unlikely decision. Noriko doubts herself. Her classmates think it's nepotism or pity, and Big Sister just thinks that she's not displayed any talent, which I think is what stings the most, because she has been kind to Noriko. But now we see that she's prepared to be much more cool and logical when lives are at stake. And this scene uh, reminds me I really need to exercise extreme caution when it comes to discussing the spin-offery for this show. One of the things I love about Gunbuster is how beautifully self-contained it is, how you can come in knowing nothing about the in-jokes and the callbacks and enjoy it from start to finish for what it is. But this scene in which Coach reveals that he is a survivor of the Luxion incident would seem to contradict the later prequel in which he and Big Sister fight together against aliens so they should already have a past by the time this scene happens. In fact, he supposedly met her when she was nine years old and he, he knew her father and her mother. Um, in fact, it's her mother that plays Go with him uh, in, in the prequel. So, you know, this is um, something that um, they really ought to know already. Then again, the pair of them do have an intimacy here, an ease with each other that suggests they do have some kind of previous contact. Um, in fact, they already have a sort of spousal level of engagement. And now we reach the uh, the midpoint, uh, coming up very shortly, of episode one, uh, which, um, oh, I think maybe it's already gone when I was looking out the window. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, the little sting uh, on television would be where the commercial break would be. Would be. And Gunbuster, of course, was made um, straight to video. There was a discussion of how it might play out as a television series. And indeed, the PlayStation spin-off game was formatted as a 25-episode series in which the six episodes of the uh, video original were integrated with 19 other chapters. But here we see a site that was very common uh, to video anime of the 1980s and which endured for a couple of decades, which was the, the illusion, the, the fancy or the conceit, if you will, um, that you were watching something that could have been on television but wasn't. And the episodic structure was also designed to match television formatting. Obviously today the world's very different. If um, HBO decides they need an episode to be three times as long as the one before, they'll just do it. And you get those wild, wildly varying run times on things like Game of Thrones and, and Stranger Things. But anime on video for years was often beholden to the idea of being 25 minutes long, including a gap for no notional adverts. And this itself was a form of nostalgia, evoking the childhoods of the video watching audience who had been, uh, you know, television watching kids back in the day. Um, in this scene where Noriko confronts Coach, it's beautifully lit with uh, muted sunset, sunset colours. And this is where Coach mentions one of the cornerstones of the show, the much-repeated mantra of Doryokoto Konjo, hard work and dedication. Um, Toshio Okada talks in his memoirs about the trouble he had um, convincing animators to draw some of the uh, more far-fetched scenes, it, it, among which he included the scene that we get out of the window here, of Big Sister uh, running upstairs in iron sandals. Um, but 
uh, here Coach alludes to, uh, uh, and there is also a very gentle allusion, I suppose, to the tagline of the Alien films. Uh, in the original, uh, it was, in space, no one can hear you scream. And here he says, uh, in space, there's nobody to count on but yourself. Um, Norio Wakamoto, by the way, uh, actually trained as a police officer. Um, he's the third Dan Black Belt in Shirinji Kempo. Uh, um, but he uh, found his vocation as a voice actor uh, shortly after punching his boss at the Consumer Federation and thereby losing his job. And for many years, this is a sad fanboy confession, uh, he was also uh, the voice of my answer phone message, which was him as coach saying, uh, after you hear the beep, and the two girl pilots saying, leave your message. That was one of the many uh, little bits of new material that was included on the Gunbuster Sound Collection, which was a digital repository, um, not only of all the music from the series, but a bunch of sound effects and dialogue. Um, the aforesaid answer phone message, trailers from the PlayStation game, fake episodes, and even a couple of uh, jokey radio dramas, including Great Battle Against the Monster Girodongas and the Saga of the Lost Engagement Ring. But anyway, this is the 1980s, so you should be not in the least bit surprised that we get a training montage, uh, which starts out reasonably enough with Noriko waking up at 4am and getting to work and getting in shape and being a better pilot. And so many of the early elements of this sequence are entirely benign and everyday, but they slowly start to diverge, particularly when the sequence starts to incorporate the fact that it's not commonly shared with high school sports anime, which is that she's going to be piloting a giant space battle machine. So Toshio Okada, who writes about this in his memoirs, says there were times when his producers would literally bundle him into a car and drive him over to various subcontractor studios because the animators were getting salty about some of the things they were being asked to do. A simple tracking shot on a still frame of a mecha doing something ridiculous is no easier or harder to do than any other shot, but some of the exhortations seemed to the animators to be unnecessarily fiddly, and asking an animator, for example, to make a sequence of a robot shadow boxing or skipping with a rope would take three or four days to produce, and the whole exercise would be essentially a throwaway visual gag. So as Toshio Okada puts it himself, some of the animators would be like, I want the man who asked for this shot to come down here and look me in the eye and tell me why we're doing it. Um, and so he writes that when he showed up in person, everyone would be very cordial and flexible and discuss matters of timing and budget. But before he arrived, he would hear reports of people saying, show me the man who wants us to do this. Someone who is particularly angry about Noriko's transformation is Reiko Kashihara, who until the arrival of Noriko considers herself to be the second ranked girl in the school after Big Sister. And she's played by Masako Katsugi, whose really major role before this was as the protagonist in Mask of Glass, the anime series about a wannabe actress. So what we have here is a woman who had previously played the go-getting passionate lead, being shoved in a box where instead she plays the jealous rival. And she was also a uh, Reko Alonde in Zeta Gundam, and among many other roles. And, and since Gunbuster, I guess, she's best known as the long-running voice of Tsunade in um, Naruto. Um, anyway, coming up, we've got a scene where uh, sh she confronts Coach in his dark office and Big Sister is surprisingly already there, like they're already canoodling. And Big Sister on the Japanese soundtrack appears to address her as Kashiwara-san. And many people, myself included, over the years have called her Kashiwara, and so does Hideaki Anno in the interview on the Gunbuster Perfect Collection. But all the studio documentation is very clear that her name is pronounced Kashihara, not the least because she was named after Yasuo Kashihara, who was the boss of Zenin production at the time. But anyway, there is a little mystery that not even I can answer, uh, Kashihara and Kashiwara are both perfectly reasonable pronunciations of that name, which is one of the reasons Japanese people rely so much on business cards to settle this kind of dispute. If you asked me as a translator, I would certainly have plumped for Kashiwara myself uh, in this incident. Um, but there is no arguing, at least not on my pay grade, uh, with the pronunciation guidelines in uh, the Complete Gunbuster Compendium, published by Bandai Visual, or the Gunbuster Perfect Guide, both of which form part of the teetering tower of books and resources that sat next to me for the last few days while I prepared to record this commentary. And I fixate on this moment, uh, 
with the Kashihara Kashiwara business, uh, just as a little illustration that there really is no right answer. Sometimes a franchise like this um, can run away with itself and create inherent contradictions that nobody can really answer. And the opinions I express in this commentary track and in all the other commentary tracks are my own. They are grounded in my research and my experience, as would anyone else's be, but I cannot guarantee 100% accuracy when studio sources themselves and creator testimonies can and do contradict each other. And this is not an uncommon situation in the media world. Uh, Hideaki Anor himself, in the interview on the Gunbuster Perfect Guide, said that he regarded Gunbuster as a creative collaboration between four major players, himself, uh, Toshio Okada as the initiator and author of the first two scripts, Hiroyuki Yamaga as the man who took those scripts and took them in a much more serious direction for episodes three and four, and Shinji Higuchi, who storyboarded so much of it. In fact, I think it was uh, uh, Toshio Okada who went so far as to say that while Anor was the director of Gunbuster, Shinji Higuchi was its star, and so many of the iconic on-screen images, as well as so many of the throwaway gags, were all the creation of Shinji Higuchi, who went on to become a movie director. So you've got four people already with their hands on the tiller, and it becomes much harder to approach this in an auteurist sense as the creation of one sole individual who can tell me how to pronounce someone's name. And that's before we get to the contributions made by other members of the team. The robots designed by Koichi Ohata, the characters designed by Haruhiko Mikimoto, a uh, formerly of Macross fame, uh, although actually he, he only did the, the, the initial designs. Um, the, the mechanical design by Kazutaka Miyatake, the music by, by Kohei Tanaka, which forms so much of Gunbuster's legacy. And the performances uh, by um, so many uh, talented uh, voice actors. Um, anyway, uh, while I've been talking, uh, Kashihara is defeated and graciously admits as much, which puts it on a character arc uh, that will have new payoffs uh, in later episodes. Uh, unlike many bullies, she's preferred to, prepared to uh, reform her opinions when they are found to be wanting, if you don't mind trial by combat, I suppose. And so Noriko and big sister Kazumi are off to join the top squadron, and as they clamber aboard their JAL uh, space shuttle, uh, Japan Airlines, we see them dressed in red jackets, deliberately designed to recall those worn by the Japanese athletes at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. That itself is a design that had to struggle for success, um, designed by Yasuyuki Mochizuki and submitted as Japanese team blazer in both 1956 and 1960, but rejected by the Olympic Committee until they suddenly relented in 64. And as they take off, you'll see the words Anor and Gainax on the advertising billboards behind the shuttle. Just another little bit of creator in jokery uh, before this first episode is done. As the shuttle takes off, we have something of a moment of artistic license where despite originating in the far south of Japan, and presumably heading for an equatorial orbital injection, which is to say even further south, it somehow manages to swing by Mount Fuji, uh, which is actually several hundred miles north of the launch site. But then again, uh, Mount Fuji is an incredibly evocative image of traditional Japan, both now and during the wartime era, to which Gunbuster will increasingly allude. In fact, there was a film made during the war about the geology of Mount Fuji, which included animated sections explaining the tectonics that led to it being formed. And I know about this because that film uh, was a rare case of animation being banned during the war because it dared to suggest that Mount Fuji was not constant and unchanging, a symbol of Japan's monolithic power, but an organic, ever-changing phenomenon. Uh, and that somehow annoyed uh, the military authorities at the time. But I digress. That's your lot for episode one, and trust me, it gets better and better as this series goes along. I'll be leaving you now with just a quick comment that the handwritten titles in this closing credit sequence were the work of the real-world Kimiko Higuchi, after whom the character of Noriko's horoscope-obsessed school friend was named. Uh, Higuchi would go on to contribute some stories to the Gunbuster manga, as well as a spin-off called Inappropriate Trivia, spilling some of the behind-the-scenes stories about the show that I'm relating to you right now, and will continue to do so in episode two. <laughs>